That's what. That's my favorite line. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're ready. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, April the nineteenth. This is your Multnomah County Board of Commissioners and our Tuesday board briefing. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting, which means that some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those who are presenting virtually, please remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking. And when you present, make sure to unmute your mic and check to see that your camera is on. Today's first briefing is on the library's capital bond program. Yay. Yay. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Commissioner. So very nice to actually see, see you. Feels like it's been forever. I'm Vailey Elke, Director of Libraries. Very happy to be here with you today to give you yet another update on the bond program. With me, I have Mike Day, who's the Director of the PMO, um, the overseeing all of the bond projects, and of course, the fabulous Tracy Massey, who is has multiple hats. Would you share your title, please? <laughs> I'm the director of county assets. Yeah, and the other amazing things. And then we also ha will have joining us a little bit Katie O'Dell, who's the deputy director at the PMO. Um, she'll be coming up and, and um, addressing you as well. So I will kick things off. And um, next slide, please. Uh, there's a brief next slide, please. Who's it? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll talk very slowly. It really is slow. Oh. Thank you, Marie. Next slide, are we able to advance? Okay. <laughs> well, in that case, I'll sing a little song. Keep things interesting. <laughs> Very jealous. You'll be singing all night and all day tomorrow yeah. as a result. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I promise it's a really amazing presentation. It is. The slideshow is particularly <laughs> riveting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on, Commissioner. <laughs> okay, I'm going to win. I'm going to try for win. I saw the original. Yeah. Original cast. Yeah. On Broadway. Yeah. You are you are special. I know. I win. <laughs> Just had to drop that. Um, I saw it in the Grand Metropolis of Portland, Oregon. I did too. It was good. Mm -hmm. Yep. I could see it again and again. It was better than Cats. All right. Better than Cats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw Cats in high school yeah. in Chicago. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I better keep that down low. <laughs> exactly. We didn't plan for this. Wait, we did not. Obviously. Pull the plates. Making okay. progress. The wheel of death spinning on it right now. So, so my, is it going? I just managed to know. get out. Okay. She has a black screen. Do we need to switch out computers and have you can't do it. We were. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll take a five minute pause. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about a good book you've read. <laughs> I wish I could. I got, I, I just got the new uh, Tana French. Oh, yeah. I've read everyone. Mm. I love her stuff. So. I've never read any of hers. Well, I know. they're a little too lowbrow for you. They're more <laughs> my speed. Hey, I they're think not... I told you I've. Been listening to all the Jack Reacher books. Yes. <laughs> confession, <laughs> true confession. But I blame my father. It's a bonding thing. We're good. 
That's how I got started on the Louise Penny to try to bond with my uh, mother-in-law. I have to say, read yeah. them all. They're quite good. All right, here we all go. All right, there we go. Yay. Phew. Okay, so thank you. Sorry for that interruption. Uh, we've got quite an agenda here, um, as you'll see. So we'll try to get to everything so that we can um, allow time for you all to ask us questions. Next slide, please. We'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands are now called Multnomah County. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. And that's uh, from the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable. We acknowledge the ancestors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Next slide, please. So these you've seen before, the library's pillars, which um, do not change, uh, upon which are built our priorities, which do evolve and change depending on the needs of our community. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy. Yes, good morning. So, and I'm Tracy Massey, the Department Director for County Assets and our Chief Information Officer. Um, this slide should be familiar. It's our um, overall bond program sequencing, and I'm happy to report there are no changes in the overall um, schedule at this point in time. The, we have many projects underway, all of the various um, chapters and the preface at the beginning. Um, our teams are continuing to confirm the project assumptions, um, schedule sequencing, working with the city on permitting to help us stay um, on schedule overall. And right now we are remaining in the time frames, even with uh, supply chain issues that <laughs> that surround us and everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this slide is about the overall uh, budget. And since our last update, um, our total program budget has increased to the 392.65 million. This uh, is up from 387 million and it, it just reflects the approved bond premium commitments of 5.65 million for um, the efforts at Albina and North Portland. Um, our overall, uh, the overall bond program owner project contingency remains at 29.1 million. And our project managers can um, approve up to 50,000 uh, without seeking uh, executive approval. And that we haven't tapped into that yet. And um, just a reminder that the bond spend down for ta the tax exempt bonds is 174.3 million to be spent by January 2024. Um, and at this point in time, we are on target. Those graphs and things at the bottom of the slide aren't meant for you to be able to review, but just show the ways that we are um, tracking our spending very closely. All right, the next slide. So uh, for, for your reference here, we have um, a bond premium procedure, uh, reserve use procedure, and this slide shows the um, examples of certain costs that would be considered to be paid for out of the bond premium reserve. So everything from unforeseen conditions, like we found at North Portland and Albina, high inflation rates, um, gaps in the project budget, unanticipated market conditions, and the like. So um, it's, it's um, being managed very closely, and we've finalized an approval process to ensure that we're managing it um, and using it appropriately, which I'm gonna talk through in the next slide. So uh, when we want to go forward and use some of the bond reserve, the uh, PMO team identifies a need and uh, using the bond premium funds or interest income earnings, 
and that is reviewed with executive sponsors, Bailey and I, um, the team and the CFO, and the team prepares our D3 document that uh, presents an analysis of what's, what's being requested, um, the background and justification, some options of uh, what, the, what we can consider, and then an overall recommendation from the team. That is presented to the sponsors and to the, and to the CFO, and if approved, we take it on to the chair for approval. Um, and then there's a process of formally signing off for it. Uh, depending on the time of year, we um, make a commitment notice to here in a board briefing, as we're doing today, and noting that the allocation of the actual funds from the reserve to the project would happen in the appropriate budget cycle. Um, alternately, if we need to use those funds in the year at hand, we would come to the board and go through a formal APR um, process. And then that is all documented and, and very transparent. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide, which you've seen before, presents the overall uh, project budget summary forecast, and um, we've updated it. So the column uh, sort of in the middle that has the last update for 4-4-2022, that's our current forecast, and that's the uh, 392.7 million. That's our forecast at this point in time and reflects the allocation of that 5.65 million from the reserve and also reflects some adjustments in, in um, our estimates and things for uh, the projects that are further along in the development cycle. Um, so that's the update on the budget. And I think I'm turning it turning now back. back. Yep. Just a, a quick um, little uh, feature. As you may recall, the Public Library Association Conference was held in person, live and in person here in Portland recently. And we were very pleased to be able to send not only several staff from the PMO, as well as obviously a lot of library staff, um, but also some of the architects. In fact, I think all of the architects that are working on the current projects had a presence at the conference and were able to share with other libraries across, across the country the work that's underway on all of these projects. And then um, the uh, many of the staff from the PMO were also able to attend various sessions at the conference. Uh, the conference theme this year was around equity and inclusion, which really aligns with um, the focus we are placing on equity and inclusion and centering the community in all of these projects. So all the reports are that people learned a lot from those sessions, but I think also importantly, people were really excited to hear the emphasis that we've placed on centering the community and centering equity in these in all of our projects in this program. So the current design teams that we have working on the five projects underway, Lever and Nolan Tam, Bora and Colocate and H Hanaberry Eddy were all able to attend um, the PLA. So um, in the next slide, please. And as I mentioned, the major theme was about equity and inclusion and um, a lot around one of the other values for us in designing these spaces, which is really designing spaces to be adaptable and flexible. And unfortunately, we're not, you know, we're not novel there. Every library in the United States is trying to figure out how to do that, given our understanding of the different ways in which people are needing to access space. So we learned a lot about some of the things that other libraries are doing to really emphasize that kind of adaptability and flexibility. Um, and also we uh, reassured ourselves that we are definitely um, being innovative and creative and out there in terms of how we're thinking about these spaces going forward. And I think it's back to over to Mike now. There we are, Mike Day. I'm the bond program director. Uh, good morning. So we'll walk through uh, updates on a DEI front, um, and also uh, check in with you on uh, the last board briefing on the uh, CDEF program. So we've got an update on that as well. Um, our DEI process has been an all-encompassing. Uh, an inclusive process and Valey, thank you for sharing that because the kind of infusing of community engagement uh, as a part of the design process into um, how we actually design and how we inform uh, the planning process uh, is a very integrated process. 
In addition, of course, with DEI, we have our uh, very ro robust procurement process uh, with our COVID outreach, uh, the, the final finalization of the regional workforce equity agreement. I think uh, you'll be hearing a report on that next week, but uh, that is now finalized. So we're in the early stages of the implementation of that at this point. Next slide, please. Some uh, highlights and milestones uh, just to share today. Uh, just again, the strong emphasis on the procurement eff efforts uh, specific to the East County flagship project uh, for both the AE and the CMGC procurements that are underway. Uh, we're currently interviewing our architects and our consultants, and they have very, very high uh, COVID uh, aspirations, which we really uh, appreciate <clears throat> that commitment and that interest to bring alongside small businesses, BIPOC firms uh, into the professional services realm. In addition, we are currently evaluating uh, our CMGC proposals that we've just received recently. And so we'll be going through that process as well. I mentioned as far as deliverables and, and milestones that we've recently hit the regional workforce equity agreement. Uh, that, that's been a huge lift, a multi-agency lift by um, Metro, by the city, by Multnomah County. So we're we're really excited to begin the implementation of that and move that forward into our projects uh, as we move into the construction phases. Next slide. I want to just highlight a recent event that was partnered with the county and Metro, uh, a supplier diversity outreach event, which really targeted small businesses, businesses of color, women owned businesses, and had a, a great turnout with over 200 participants that attended that event. Uh, and it was a very uh, engaging virtual event that we had. Let's move on to the next slide. This just highlights for you kind of a snapshot of where we're at today with specific kind of COVID participation for our active projects for the Operations Center, Holgate, Midland, Albina, and North Portland. As we progress and move into the construction phases, You'll have a lot more detail. We'll have reports and dashboards and uh, more metrics, both on the COVID disaggregation of what that looks like on specific projects, as well as the workforce pieces. The operations center will be the first one out of the gate. And with that starting in construction in late July, early August, we expect that uh, in the, the next coming briefings, we'll have more to share with you. All right, I, uh, we promised that we would get back to you on the uh, next slide, please. The Construction Diversity Equity Fund and really the mechanics of that fund and how that fund is set up. The, the bond program contributes 1% of the construction cost to this fund, which equates to somewhere in the two to two and a half million dollar range that goes in, directly into that program. Now the program is managed by central purchasing and it supports initiatives to develop lo local construction workforce, the pre-apprenticeship programs, and of course, technical assistance that is vital to mentoring, building up, uh, and training COVID firms. I'm gonna turn it to Katie to update you on some specific community engagement highlights. Good morning, good morning. I'm Katie O'Dell, and I am the Deputy Director for the PMO. Um, on the library side of our projects. And before we got into specific project updates, we just wanted to give you a general sense of how community engagement's been going. As you've heard from both Kate and Mike, uh, centering the community's voice has been at the heart of this project and one of our key values we've been working from. And uh, we are learning a great deal by having uh, two different firms working on the two different sets of public projects. And it's giving us a lot of insight and really helped influence how we prepared the RFP and what we'll be asking for for the flagship. Uh, so constant learning process for us. So um, on Holgate and Midland, um, there has been um, a lot of really multiple layers of community engagement. We have had um, large scale um, surveys that have gone out. We have had focus groups going to specific audiences getting in touch with neighborhood associations and making presentations, sharing with them where we're headed. Um, but one of the really exciting parts of Holgate and Midland is this community design advocates program in which we have recruited 
um, over a dozen community members who represent are and in part of multiple sub communities communities uh, that they are a part of, and they are doing their own grassroots focus groups conversations and reporting in that has just multiplied and spread who we've been able to hear from that maybe didn't fall into already part of an organization we've been reaching out to or who weren't able to attend an online meeting. Um, and, and, and so we're also looking for how do we keep them connected to the project too. They've done so much now at the outstart. Um, we're thinking maybe they might like to come back as ambassadors when we open up the library, but they'll continue to really be for us a through line um, of reaching different audiences that uh, we may have not before or in greater detail. And I should also point out these were paid positions as well, which actually enabled many different people to be able to apply for them because their time um, was going to be compensated. Uh, in addition, uh, at Holgate and Midland, we're going to have a community newspaper coming out in the next stage after our uh, design development is pretty darn solid. Um, and we have some voting coming up on interior design options for both the public and staff uh, so they can get uh, a real voice in sort of the vibe and the feel of when you walk into the building. And as a um, Martha Stewart HGT lover, it is so fun to have professionals like walk you through some vibes for a for a library. So that's going to be really fun. And we'll make sure you guys know when the voting is open. Next slide. And then over at um, Albina and North Portland, they're on a slightly different schedule. And so we're, we are working on through schematic design where ideas are getting more solidified, but aren't fully developed yet. So there's a lot of community engagement still going on. I do want to highlight that there's going to be um, another large scale public event at North Portland Library in May on Saturday, May 14th. We had one there um, earlier in this design process and had a pretty great turnout. Uh, there will be um, design exercises. There's going to be a report out of where we are um, and a lot of opportunities for people to share uh, their ideas and really start to refine down from all of the great ideas we've heard. Where are we going to put our time, money, and most importantly, score footage on this project? Um, we're also working on uh, scheduling a series, almost a dozen of paid community focus groups, getting to some audiences that we just feel like we haven't really been able to connect with as closely um, through the project connections. And this project features the youth opportunity design approach, Yoda. Uh, they've completed their winter cohort and we just have a spring one. These also are paid positions that recruit teens um, from nearby both libraries and then they go through really the design process right at the elbow of our A&E teams and they've shared they really liked community building and so we've doubled up on their sessions and they also meet with library staff and have hangout time at the library so they can get to know each other and just be a part of the library as well as the construction projects. So some more of those sessions coming up and I, I think that could be it for our community engagement for now. Right. Well, I would just add to that, that the, the threat of community engagement doesn't just stop as we complete the design, but uh, we're looking for ways to make sure that we're informing and bringing the community into the room as we move into the construction phases as well, so that that will be a continuum until we uh, open and even after uh, during the operations of the new facilities. With that, uh, let's move to the next slide and we're gonna highlight our five active projects today. Uh, we'll also touch on uh, technology as well as just an update on the East County flagship uh, process that we are in. Next slide, we're gonna move to operations now. Uh, this is a graphic that uh, is certainly a familiar one that really exemplifies the uh, path to net zero uh, and truly a net zero carbon neutral building with the operations center. Some updates on that next slide are really reflected here as we look at uh, finishing up the design. We're now in the permit process uh, and again, meeting our lead gold sustainability requirements, engaging with RAC uh, on the arts front as well as with PBOT on some of the offsite street improvements that happen um, adjacent to this development. Next slide. This just gives you a, a sense of space in terms of uh, the orientation of collections uh, and how everything flows within the overall facility. Next slide. And as you move up to the second floor, 
again, you've, you've got that sense of space. And I know it's really hard to see with very small diagrams like this what's actually happening. So um, if there's interest in learning more about the specifics uh, of the, the layouts, we're happy to share that in a different breakout session. Moving on to schedule, next slide. So we are still on target and tracking for our fall 2023 opening. Uh, the permits, as I said, have been submitted to the city uh, and we'll be coming back to you uh, later this summer and June timeframe for the FAC1 approval for the guaranteed maximum price and construction mobilization happening later this summer in July. So we'll, uh, we'll have more planning on that with uh, just some shovel turns and uh, getting in the dirt and starting our first construction project. Next slide. I move through these fairly quickly, but um, you can look at them at, at kind of on your, your own if you have questions on budget. The overall budget has not changed for the operations center. What you see in terms of transfers uh, in that middle column really reflect the transfers within the budget uh, to allocate the uh, solar funds for the net zero portion of the project. Next slide. Moving to Holgate now. This is just kind of the, the rendering of uh, the existing library, which is going to be replaced. And we'll go into that in more detail. Next slide, please. The design is progressing nicely on Holgate as we've moved uh, into this design development. That's more in the detailed design phase. Uh, we went through a, kind of the proof of concept, which is your conceptual and schematic design. Went through the budget validation process to make sure that program and design were aligned with budget. Uh, made decisions around resiliency uh, and what the, the structural type is, the mass timber system. Uh, is the, uh, the preferred structural system, which has wonderful, wonderful architectural benefits too. Moving on to the next slide. These next two slides give you a sense of what the space looks like. Uh, the first drawing highlights some of the areas that are highlighted that are what I would consider to be the, those minor refinements that happen if, as you go through the iterative process of design. Um, these refinements include Kind of re reorientation of the stairs uh, and how we've uh, placed break rooms uh, and staff work areas. Next slide. The second floor gives you that sense of space as it relates to um, collections, conference rooms, uh, and breakout areas. Next slide. As we began to look at the interior design and materiality of uh, different types of materials that can be used, the design team is exploring an array of different um, materials uh, that have visual impact in terms of how, how spaces are opened up and also how you can secure space during off hours. Next slide. On the schedule front, uh, again, we're tracking to our uh, target schedule. Nothing's changed uh, from our last meeting with you. And we'll be coming back to you later this fall with a FAC1 for the guaranteed maximum price. Next slide. No changes to the budget. Tracking to the budget and the overall uh, updates uh, based on preliminary designs are tracking very nicely with our target budget. Now on the Midland, next slide. A lot to go through here. I know with five projects, so it's a lot to cover. Uh, the Midland updates, uh, th this is a combination of a renovation and addition. So uh, it has a little bit of a different uh, approach in terms of design and programming. Um, but on a similar path to Holgate, we've finished the schematic design phase. We're now moving into detailed design or design development. Uh, really review, beginning to review the interior character of the building. And also, I would say for all of our projects, uh, safety and security is a top priority and we're engaging with a, an outside consultant to come alongside our architects and our engineers, as well as the library staff to look at holistically um, security and safety for the building and for the patrons. Resilience on Midland 
is following uh, essentially the life safety code requirements, and, and that's called risk category two. Uh, and the similar to Holgate, we've got a mechanical system, which is uh, the VRF system. It's variable refrigerant frequency, I think. <laughs> So uh, we won't get too nerdy on that today. Um, next slide, if you will. This really gets you a sense of kind of the overall spatial layout of both the existing building and how that's been renovated along with the new building. And just wanted to highlight here uh, really around security and safety, uh, the opportunities and how we're developing kind of the off hour uh, being able to keep the library open during off hours, but separating certain sections of the library so that access to the entire library is kind of pulled back into specific areas. As you move to the next slide, you'll get a sense of the exterior and what the exterior looks like along with some, some images uh, moving into the building uh, and strategies around the possibilities of art. Uh, we're in the early stages of working with RAC on looking at places where art could really be uh, amplified uh, to create uh, wonderful spaces for this library. Next slide. This gives you uh, interior views and concepts of some of the considerations around where art could be showcased along with collections and just some of the other architectural elements to, to not only bring natural light into the building, but to uh, uh, bring natural materials in as well. On the schedule front, next slide. We're tracking to our original schedule with the spring and summer uh, completion of the project and uh, looking at coming back to you again later this fall fairly concurrent with the Holgate project. So those projects are on a very similar path as far as getting to the guaranteed maximum price. Moving on to the next slide on the budget front, there are not no changes uh, to the Midland budget. It's tracking very closely to our target budgets. And now to Albina, next slide. So next slide with Albina. On Albina, we are uh, in an earlier phase of moving into the schematic design now. We took a, a bit of a, a pause to really look at some key issues with both Albina and North Portland relating to the historic buildings and the strategy around how to preserve uh, both the historic libraries, uh, bringing them up to code, and how those would really layer into uh, the additions that are conceived uh, for Albina and North Portland. So earlier, Tracy shared with you a little bit about uh, a reallocation of the bond reserve and uh, Albina has received an infusion of funds from that bond reserve to address the seismic and program alignment issues. Next slide. This shows you uh, some really interesting seismic techniques uh, and through the seismic research that was done by our structural engineer an innovative solution that saved at least $2 million on how to preserve and seismically reinforce uh, the Albina Library. Rather than being invasive and going into the inside of the building to seismically reinforce the unreinforced masonry, we came up with an approach where we're able to access the hollow clay tile from the outside by removing a small section of roof and grouting and filling uh, the masonry uh, from the outside preserving the inside of the building. So great, great brainstorming that took place there, resulting in really uh, excellent value uh, in terms of how the taxpayer dollars are being spent. Next slide now. In, in, the, in spite of the fact that we did step back and take that pause, the go slow to go fast, if you will, uh, we've uh, allowed the team to really readjust and shift priorities so that schematic design, design development, and the construction start dates would not be impacted. So just through some minor resequencing, we we're able to maintain our original target schedule. Next slide. Here with the budget, you'll see the, the transfer of funds that have been transferred in to address both the seismic and program alignment issues. Next slide. Now to North Portland. With North Portland, uh, again, a, a Carnegie's uh, historic library, 
This is mostly a renovation, historic renovation with a small addition. So with, uh, with this project also, we went through the same process as far as a seismic uh, review process and an investigative process to determine the best method for how to preserve uh, the existing building. And through that process, uh, we came to a conclusion as far as what the seismic strategy would be. Now we're moving into the schematic design phase and maintaining the original schedule uh, that was published. So next slide shows you, and again, this gets into a lot of detail, but I'll just highlight uh, the, the overall strategy for seismic for North Portland really is to take the roof diaphragm and roof structure and to tie that back into the overall foundation system. So what you see on the picture uh, on your right is some red lines that go from the roof trusses down into what will be added columns that will essentially transfer the load from the roof uh, down into the foundation system. Moving on to the next slide now. So again, a uh, schedule is being maintained. We've re reordered our priorities, but maintaining the overall scheduling and sequencing of the work to meet our target dates for the substantial completion in the summer of 2024. And the next slide, please. This again, just kind of the, the repeat of the allocation from the bond premium and the commitment uh, from the bond premium and those transfers and adjustments that have been made to the budget. Now to the refresh. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, so overall, the refresh uh, uh, is going well. We're really getting uh, energy behind the and momentum behind kind of program definition and really prioritizing of uh, all the refresh projects. The, the priority out of the gate uh, being the central library uh, and this summer with uh, all the under restrooms being started with construction. So we'll actually be starting our first refresh project uh, this summer uh, at the central library. Hannah Berrietti uh, is our uh, planning and design architect and working with us uh, on Central as well as uh, beginning the planning work on the other refresh libraries. Uh, lastly, uh, I would update that we have just recently hired our CMGC partner, uh, Swinerton Builders, and we're currently in contract negotiations with Swinerton. Next slide, please. On, on the schedule front, uh, again, we're still in the early phases. And so with the onboarding of Swinerton and now with Hannah Berrietti on board, there will be more information in terms of sequencing and the overall phasing and logistics of the projects, as well as going through a, a validation process and prioritization in terms of the budget. Next slide, please. This gives you kind of an overall kind of snapshot of where we're at with the East County flagship, the proposed timeline. Uh, we are currently tracking and on schedule with that, uh, with our overall procurement process. As I said earlier, uh, we'll be onboarding our architects and our contractors here over the course of the next month to month and a half. And we're still in the process of looking at and narrowing down the site selection process. The goal uh, being an opening of fall of 2025 for the new East County uh, flagship located in the Gresham area. Moving on to the next slide now. We're getting close. Uh, information technology updates. Just wanted to highlight uh, kind of these major kind of focused areas that are being integrated into our designs with the automated material handling. Uh, the picture and the graphic that you see there uh, really reflects an example of how that uh, system works. And we're in the final stages of negotiating that contract and integrating that into the operations center. Following that will be the more detailed integration of that design into the um, chapter one projects, as well as central and other refresh projects. The RFID, uh, just highlighting that uh, as a quick example of the, the integration of of equity in our community and really hearing the community voice as we uh, work through our designs uh, and, and really understand the needs uh, of the patrons, both with RFID as well as uh, audio visual strategies and solutions uh, have been very integrated in terms of that inclusive design process. Next slide. 
this kind of moves us to uh, a wrap up, but really kind of reiterating some of the things I've shared already with things that we're looking at at the program level, but also at the project level as far as risks and continuing to evaluate and monitor the market conditions uh, with the inflationary headwinds that we're facing. Uh, what are those impacts? What are those potential impacts? Um, and how does that relate to the overall budget and how we're tracking? As the pandemic is uh, moving into a new season uh, and we have other world events that are happening, of course, we continue to face labor shortages, uh, supply chain issues, and these are also considerations that our project teams are looking at in terms of uh, potential early purchases, for example, of mechanical and electrical equipment that we may do out of sequence so that we get that into the pipeline, knowing that we have longer lead times on things. And then, of course, permitting is always a challenge with any local jurisdiction and just working closely with the cities. Uh, City of Portland and Gresham as we work through that process. And then the site acquisition process for the East County flagship. Next steps and moving on as we wrap up here uh, again, continued uh, outreach with community events as Katie shared and that really being a continuum thread through all of our projects. The validations of the schedule, the spend down um, and making sure that we've got strategies around meeting those spend down targets. Uh, the ongoing uh, budget validation and alignment process so that that target value design of aligning budget uh, with our programs uh, leaves us with no surprises. Uh, and then uh, again, just monitoring the, the escalation and inflationary headwinds, our COVID outreach process with our com community partners, with our CMGC partners, and really taking the regional workforce equity agreement, the, the project labor agreement, if you will, and implementing that onto our projects. With that, I will open it up for questions. Uh, table. Questions for us. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman, we'll start with you today. I have so many questions, but they're all good questions. Bailey, you know what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> when? <laughs> what, what, what's our drop dead date? Uh, what is that drop dead date? Do we have to have a site for the East County? For the flag? Oh, um, by a, essentially first quarter of next year, as okay. far as having a purchase and sale agreement finalized. Okay. So you can back it up from there in terms of getting. Yeah, so we're, we're in that, what I would call the early site. I would say more than early, but we're in site due diligence and we have uh, two or three sites uh, that we're going through that site due diligence on. Yeah, East County, like they're just like, <laughs> you know, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. And I, if I may um, yes. just add to that, you know, we've been, as Mike mentioned, we've been um, interviewing the various AE firms who have applied specifically to work on this project. And the language that they're using to describe this project is pretty remarkable. You know, one firm said this is the most important building that will have been built in Multnomah County in 100 years. Wow. And, um, you know, people, people have been planning for two years to apply to build this building. I mean, it's pretty stunning in terms of the scope and um, how those sorts of uh, firms are looking at this project and the impact it, it will have on that community. And not just, you know, the Gresham area, but all of East County. I mean, it's, it's pretty profound. It's very exciting. It is, and thank you. I, you or your office sent me some talking points for a neighborhood association meeting. And in my talking points, refresh my memory, uh, the Seattle Library, the economic uh, impact. impact. Mm -hmm. What was that number? Boy, um, boy, like, you've, you've not I want to say it was like $16 million. It was, it was dramatic. And, and we're confident that it will have a similar impact in East County, this building, in terms of attracting but traffic, um, retail, um, there's there's a lot of housing going up um, in Gresham in that area that we think, you know, any of the sites we're looking at could contribute to. I think it'll really make a big difference for that community. Very I'm exciting. super excited. Yes. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we know that we've had some challenges, um, you know, with our houseless neighbors and some of our libraries. And I'm just wondering, have you all, yeah, I'm sure you've considered this, but is there any talk about having a co-location of services, particularly at maybe the East County flagship library? 
Yeah, we've definitely looked at that just sort of across the board in terms of what would make good partnerships. The flagship in particular, you know, the intent with that building is for it to be sort of a singular iconic building. That doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities to have other services located on site, um, but the building itself, the, the hope is that it's a, a library and not a multi-use facility, just largely because of how big it's gonna be. You know, it's going to be 95,000 square feet, which is much, Bigger than, for instance, the Hollywood Library, which is a co-located um, facility, or Selwood, which are much smaller facilities. But I think there's always that those opportunities, and we've had similar sorts of conversations. For instance, um, at the Albina Project, there's some development happening there that I think will be very complementary. And so we've been in communication with the church, who's doing that a lot, overseeing some of that development. And I think those are the kinds of conversations we'll continue to have to see how we can leverage that. And you know, we. I mean, we talk a lot, you and I, in fact, every one of you up there have had many conversations over the years about, um, you know, how the library serves uh, people experiencing houselessness and the library's role in those lives. And it's, um, it's important to us. It also comes with some challenges for um, public service and uh, no more so than right now. And the wonderful thing about these projects is it is a completely unique opportunity for us to factor in some of those issues in terms of how we're designing brand new spaces and opportunities we just simply didn't don't have with these ex existing spaces. Well, that's that's exciting, Bailey. And I think so. Do you have all your advisory boards are, chosen? The mm -hmm. members are all up and running. Yep. The over the bond oversight committee is meeting regularly. We have another meeting in next week, I think it is. Next next Monday. Yeah. And do you ha you have one specific for the flagship library? We don't yet, but um, it's quite likely we'll have something like that for the flagship. If if not a formal bond oversight committee, we have one for the whole bond. But we'll be definitely um, including the committee a lot. Okay. In that project, and it, yeah. What'd you say? In outreach. And yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I said yes before yeah. I even knew what she said. Yes, exactly. I mean, there will be just as we've done with all of the existing projects, there will be a significant emphasis on community engagement, really authentic community engagement and participation and how those buildings are designed and um, how that com the community is reflected in those spaces. And I had another question. Um, some of you may or may not know, but uh, the Gresham Urban Renewal is going out for an extension of their URA. And a question came up, if that would, if it passed or if it didn't pass, what impact, would that have any impact on the library funding? No, no the bond funding is separate. Yeah. Um, and as far as I know, that particular district, the properties we're looking into aren't in, in that district. Right, okay, very good. Well, I mean, I was just thinking in terms that if it, if it didn't pass, then that tax increment finance would go back right. to taxing jurisdictions, but but you all, the library wouldn't be part of that. Right. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, super excited, Construction Diversity Equity Fund. Thank you, Chair Kafori, to see that actually happening. So can't, can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, and it looked August, 2024, y'all got some major projects opening. It's gonna be a great, great summer. Uh, but 2025 is when the East Multnomah County building, uh, flagship library will be opening. So very, very exciting. It'll be a big party. Yeah. So just like good, you know, good things year after year after year on the horizon. So, so excited. Thank you all for being here. Commissioner. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bailey and Tracy and Mike and Katie. Um, this is, it's always great to hear about all of the, um, good work that is happening and so much work that is happening. Um, I also was really glad to hear about all the work that's happening with diversity, equity, inclusion, and the outreach to the COVID firms. I had a opportunity to speak at the small business um, event back in, in March, um, along with um, Lynn Peterson, or President Peterson about that. And it was great to see all those firms that were interested in learning how to be a part of some of these projects that um, the County and Metro is doing. Um, I was also really glad to hear that you're thinking about ways to keep the um, the CDAs involved in the work ongoing because I think that's um, you know that's a wonderful structure that we've had to have the opportunity to get those folks involved and and have re outreach into the community in ways that we haven't before and so um, I think that's really important especially when we think about what we want libraries to be and being that community space and community con convening. 
um, space. Um, and I will look forward to getting my community newsletter, especially about the Midland Library, um, in I was the mail. Of as we were showing, <laughs> thinking. Um, but I'm also curious: Are there going to be larger, like countywide communications about the status of the different projects on the website? I know you guys have the the project website right now, but right. as as the work starts going, are you going to be doing updates yeah. on that? Well, yeah. So we have within the PMO, we have a communications group that's responsible for the overall communications related to the bond, and they're really active in terms of how to get that information out. We'll, you know, you mentioned the website, which we have that has regular updates, and then there's a we send out updates for anyone who signs up for those. So there's also an opportunity for members of the community to sign up um, on the library's website to get those regular updates from us about that. So those two um, options are there. And then we'll also be doing regular communications over the course of all the projects, sp specific to each project and then more generally. Yeah, I think that's big because I think people are interested to see like how all of these projects are going, how the dollars are going to be coming into effect, um, and everybody, you know, everybody wants to see what's happening with their library too. Um, it was great to see the the layouts of the all of the different projects. I felt like with Holgate and Midland, but Holgate especially, it was like like the plan looks so amazing. And then you're like, no, but wait, there's more. There's a whole second floor, you know? So it's, I mean, it's just really incredible the changes that are going to be happening and what the community is going to have access to with with these projects. Um, you know, and Commissioner Segman brought up some of the questions around kind of um, safety and concerns around that. I was just curious, um, especially with, um, you know, some of the design features like line of sight or access to areas, like how that's being incorporated into some of the design questions. I'm, you know, I was thinking, looking at the Midland one and looking at like the Children's Center is kind of in the back. Is that by on purpose or, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. That is a major filter for how we're designing these spaces. And Mike mentioned, I don't know if you caught it, we're actually bringing in mm -hmm. um, to the design process someone who has that security background um, to help us understand where else in terms of design we need to be thinking about opportunities for, you know, to the degree possible, making sure these spaces are as safe and um, and secure as, as possible as a, as a public space. So yeah, line of sight is a huge piece of that. You know, one of the other uh, things is that you'll see in all of these buildings is that we're lowering, which contributes to line of sight, we're lowering the shelving so that you can see across, you know, way down to the other end of the building. So there aren't as many nooks and crannies like as we have, for instance, with Central, which is full of nooks and crannies, which creates challenges. Um, so that's a big piece of it. And then, you know, the architects also, you know, for instance, with Midland and, and I'll welcome Mike or Tracy to chime in here, you know, they redesigned the entryway, for instance, to ensure that um, it isn't a space where you can walk in and then sort of feel like trapped in there um, in case there's a patron who is um, misbehaving. Uh, so those kinds of things are all being factored into how these spaces are being designed. And we've learned it's, you know, as I said, you can't um, overstate what an opportunity it is to be able to design spaces and build them with this in mind, rather than constantly trying to have to adapt existing spaces where that was never a consideration. All right, thank you for that. I mean, yeah. it's, it is it is an important thing, and I think it's something we're all thinking about, and I'm glad it's being so um coordinated in all of the projects that are happening. Absolutely. It's a it's a major priority. Yeah. Good. And I just my last comment is just it's really great to see the the north um, branch and the albina branch like really you know how you keeping the historic beauty and importance of those buildings but also making sure they're seismically resilient and they're you're going to be able to serve the community. So just great job on that. It's quite a trick. You know, I I know I've shared with all of you that I've re read back on all of the notes from you know Mary Frances Eisman, one of my by some one of my predecessors and when they were building those buildings back in the early 1900s and to try to imagine they're still standing and that we're adapting them now to a 21st century use is pretty amazing. That's great. Well, thank you guys all so much. You're very welcome. Christian. So very Portland, like our hundred year old bridges. Eh, well, there's that. I'm <laughs> glad that's. Yeah, yeah. Not mine. <laughs> Chris, thank you, Chair. Thank you all. Yeah, these updates are just always so um, Hopeful, you know, um, as Commissioner Stegman said, good things happening year after year after year. It's really, really exciting. Um, just a couple of comments. Appreciate the attention to security. Appreciated Commissioner Vega Peterson's question about that. Um, and it, it is something that's on everybody's mind. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that we have a chance to design with that in mind. 
I'm curious then about Albina and North Portland, where we don't, we're not building new or redesigning to the same extent. You know, have you had that conversation about those buildings and what's possible there? Obviously, lowering stacks would be one, but are there other possibilities? Definitely. And, you know, Albina will be a major new building. So we will have opportunities for, um, with the exception of that, what is currently the title? Well, now the Albina Financial Library. <laughs> Hard to keep track. Um, so that will have lots of opportunities for those kinds of considerations. And then North Portland, because it's so small, they, we're still renovating the interior. So there will be some opportunities there. I, I don't know if you'd add anything else to that. Mike. It's in the very early phases of planning and design, but you know, the highlighting and the focus around safety and security is definitely in the forefront of everyone's mind, uh, both the, the library users, uh, executive leadership, and then our planners and designers that are ultimately going to be working uh, together hand in hand with the library to make sure we have really safe uh, programs. Yeah. So more, more to come on that. Um, yeah. I think engaging with a safety and security consultant that brings in a fresh uh, look and perspective mm -hmm. also will be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I was really glad to, to, to hear about that. I think that's great. Um, also wanted to appreciate the CDEF and, and the mass timber. I think that's, that's Super pretty cool, cool that we're using mass timber in one of the buildings. That's really exciting. Um, and then just one other question about, about rack and the 2% for art. Um, I am curious about what, what that number is and, um, you know, how that's, uh, I know there's a conversation about how much of that will get spent on art. So curious about what that is looking like. Well, the number is 2% of the ultimately where we end up with the construction costs as far as, you know, what the agreement with rack is and how that's calculated. So that's probably in the four to five. I couldn't do the mental math. Yeah. <laughs> I think for I, you I, to do it. It's four and a half to $5 million uh, that is earmarked through the RAC program to art. Um, you know, of the 2%, it breaks down into three different pieces. So there's the art piece, and then there is the administration piece that's a part of that, as well as the operations and maintenance. So it's, it's you know, the actual art itself is not the four and a half million, it's a, a smaller number. Got it. Yeah. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to get an art tour of the courthouse on Friday. Um, yes, I recommend it. It is <laughs> wonderful. It's a great way to spend a Friday afternoon. Um, really wonderful. And, you know, just thinking about what what that adds and how that changes the experience of people in the building. It changed my experience just as a casual visitor and to someone who has to spend a lot of time there or, you know, often in different cer difficult circumstances. It's really, really important. And I think that's true of the library as well, that the art adds so much that we can't quantify to the experience of being in that library. Um, so I am interested, you know, maybe offline to talk a little bit more about that and how that conversation is going. One last thing I would add is that Bailey is very hands-on in this particular area and um, which I love so that that expression of art really does get thoughtfully brought into the libraries. Um, the other thing that uh, we're allowed to do within the bond program is really um, earmark the art to its highest and best use. So managing it at the portfolio level versus the project level allows us to, to really focus on areas where, you know, we get the, the most out of the art. And the most exposure to the community. You know, I, one of the things we've talked about is even having galleries for members of the community to, to exhibit their art. You know, I think that would be really rich and a lovely way to connect. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for really enhancing those spaces and connecting with the communities and the cultures of those communities. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And also, you know, in I forget which library it was, I think both Holgate and um, Midland incorporating art into the security feature that met the screening, exactly. things like that. It's really wonderful. So um, thank you. It's all, all just great. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Myron. I, I, there's not um, much left to, to say um, that's new, just in terms of the appreciation for all that you've done. And there are so many phenomenal things that you've presented in this update. And so I just wanna thank each of you individually and the um, teams behind you that have put so much effort into this work. And this is a, a great presentation. I loved, 
I love seeing the beautiful spaces. I love the architectural plans. It just was, it was a really um, engaging pr uh, presentations. And one of the things that I think about, um, there, there are a couple of things that I just particularly appreciated, wanted to call out. Um, but one of the things was, as my colleagues have mentioned, that the focus on um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and our libraries are such uh, an example of what it means to truly belong in our communities. They are the place where everyone, you know, everyone can belong. And how do we foster that? And it just makes me think about the amazing conference that we, some of us were at yesterday, Professor John Powell, I don't know, oh my, oh my gosh, it, he talked to elected leaders from around the region about sort of equity and inclusion 2.0, and there's target, targeted universalism and belonging, and there were just some really visionary concepts, and um, I would love to talk to you about some of these and how that fits into the thinking and the work you're doing around um, equity and inclusion. So. Yeah, his work on targeted universal oh. was just brilliant. And we think about that and talk about that a lot um, at the library. You know, one of the things that, uh, and you know, by now you know what a lousy memory I have, but recently someone said over the course of all these projects, everyone deserves beauty. You know, and I wrote that down in front of my uh, computer to remind me that um, this is an opportunity. All of these projects are an opportunity to really live that in terms of these spaces, because you're right, Commissioner. I mean, unlike almost any other space in our community, libraries truly are meant for everyone. And, you know, the price of admission is just being a member of this community. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to create that kind of beauty and access that some of us take for granted, but a lot of us don't have access to otherwise. So I think this community doesn't know what's what's ahead of it, what's gonna hit them. These buildings are gonna be amazing. Um, and just uh, just a couple of questions I wanted to raise. Um, I mean, there's so much I appreciate it, I have a whole list, but just of time. Um, safety and security that was touched on. So, you know, obviously, as Commissioner Jaibal said, a huge issue for all of us. Um, we did talk about engaging, the engagement really is incredible and uh, I was so inspired by it. I'm wondering for particular, particular groups, so I think about people with um, disabilities, elders, and people who are houseless, and have there been sort of focus groups or engagement with those particular communities? And I think about um, some of the work that can be done at, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, people who are blind, people with mobility issues, and sort of how how some of those groups are being included. Absolutely. In and technology creates a lot of opportunities to meet the needs of people who are differently abled, in particular with vision and hearing. We have a disability accommodations group at the library. We've had it for years. And those people are involved in how we think about these. Again, it's just yet another opportunity to actually design spaces. You know, um, there are libraries that are building in, for instance, um, sensory spaces for families who have kids with sensory um, sensitivity issues, and that would have never happened. I mean, we don't have anything like that in any of our libraries. So, I mean, all of those things are possibilities. And as we get further into design and are learning more and more from our community in terms of what those needs are, those will all be taken into account for how those spaces are designed. For sure, definitely. Um, and uh, just question about, you know, the, the IT, aspect of things. And um, I know that you have always been a huge uh, broadband mm -hmm. supporter. And there is some collaborative work continuing in the community after we did the feasibility study. Are you engaged in that in that work? You are someone from? We are. We definitely are. I don't know if Tracy you want to answer this, but um, two of our the library's IT manager and then Jacob Farkas, who's overseeing all of the technology, so this is very involved, right? Very involved in all of that, along with our digital access coordinator involved in how we look at um, 
you know, extending access. Yeah. Yeah. And then one just last, uh, you know, and we're talking about rack and all of the beautiful art um, and in having maybe an opportunity to um, to show some of the art from community. And I don't know if you know of an organization called Gather Make Shelter, which engages the houseless community and connects them to professional artists and just does incredible work um, and fosters creativity and brings people together and creates community and just I, you know, I can send you information or yeah. stuff to connect I, you about I, them. I have a vague which yeah. and recollection of Rack mentioning, you know, because a lot of what they do is through partnership and other organizations as well. So like Portland Street Alliance and Gather Make Shelter. So I I I, I expect that those are the kinds of conversations we'll have about who our artists are and how we're engaging people and yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Now it's time to get back to work. All right. We got <laughs> stuff to do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Timelines time. to be met, my friends. Thank you. All right. Our next briefing is from the Joint Office of Homeless Services on Built for Zero. Um, and I'll just kick it off while our guests are coming forward or their lovely faces are arriving on the screen. Um, as we continue to deploy the new funding from the Metro Supportive Housing Services measure, we have stayed true to the commitments that we made to voters in 2020. Those commitments obviously included uh, the significant investments in supportive housing and in shelter, but to demonstrate results and to keep improving our shelter and housing programs, we're also investing in how we collect and analyze our data. Today's presentation on Built for Zero presented by the Joint Office of Homeless Services and Community Solutions is an important piece of that ongoing work. And here to introduce this morning's briefing is Lori Kelly, the Planning and Evaluation Manager from the Joint Office. Good morning, good to see you in person. Hi there, I'm Lori Kelly. I also want to introduce that I have some people um, phoning it in to make sure that they can do it. I, they can quickly introduce themselves. Hey everyone, I'm Alyssa Kyle. I'm a system improvement advisor at Community Solutions on the Built for Zero team. And hello, I'm Steve Richard, data manager at the Joint Office, and I use he him pronouns. Good morning, Shannon Singleton. My oh, Shannon, we can't hear you. Uh, you're very, very faint. Can you hear me now? Uh, not really. Okay, we did a sound check and it worked, so I'll pop off and see. Something. Shannon Singleton, the interim director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services there. I'll, I'll just do it for you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so we will jump into this and try to put the brief in briefing. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Alyssa, who's going to do an overview of what Built for Zero is um, in general terms. Alyssa? Thanks, Lori. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. I'll kind of cruise through these first couple just to give an overview of community solutions and built for zero before we get to kind of the core of uh, the presentation, which is what are we doing in Portland, Multnomah County right now? Um, so just to go over the mission, the mission and vision of community solutions, our mission is to um, find a lasting end to homelessness that leaves no one behind. And our vision, we can go to the next slide is uh, to create an a just and equitable future where homelessness is rare, brief when it occurs, and never a way of life. So when I talk about our approach to uh, ending homelessness and, and reaching our metric called functional zero, I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, um, but it really means that we want every community to be able to really quickly to resp respond to every individual's circumstances, episodes of homelessness to ensure that they are experiencing homelessness for the shortest amount of time possible and no one is ever stuck in, you know, years and decades of living unsheltered or houseless. Go to the next slide. So our approach, we partner with communities like we're doing with you all. And we partner with communities both domestically and internationally to use creative data and problem solving strategies to help our local teams do three things, get people out of homelessness more quickly, 
identify and turn off the sources of new inflow. So helping people, helping to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place or experiencing additional episodes of homelessness. And then rapidly develop the affordable housing supply that communities need to end homelessness. And that third one is our real estate work, which I won't go uh, into too deeply today, but we do offer that. But one and two um, are really how we partner with communities in the way that we're working with you all in Portland, Multnomah County. Next slide. Great. And so Build for Zero is sort of the bread and butter of community solution services and how we work with folks. And currently there's over 90 communities that are part of the Built for Zero movement, um, 90 communities in the U.S. and then there's several abroad as well. And these communities are working to redefine what is possible in the movement to end homelessness. And our next slide just has a, a bit of an overview of where we're working. So you can see this map here. This is a little outdated, so it has 84 communities. This was before our last action cycle started um, in November 2021. So we've added a handful of additional um, counties, cities, communities. Um, 13 so far have ended veteran or chronic homelessness, which means that they've hit our metric of functional zero, and I'll cover that in a moment, um, for one or both of those subpopulations. And then you can read a little bit um, of the other statistics on there as well. But the one I'll highlight, um, because that's what we're working on right now with you all, is to achieve quality real-time data through a by name list. And so, so far, um, 80 communities have hit that sort of milestone. So we have confidence that their data is comprehensive um, and they have a solid understanding of who is experiencing homelessness in their community. Next slide. This just lists all of the communities, so you can definitely look. There's a couple of other um, uh, Oregon communities that we're working with, which is exciting. And the next slide. Perfect. Thank you. And so um, what over the next few years, here's really what Community Solutions is trying to do in partnership with these communities that we're working with. So first, by 2024, we want homelessness to be widely understood as a societal issue that is solvable. For so long, and we'll, I'll go into some of the problems that we see with how homeless response systems have been designed historically, but one of those biggest issues is that it's not widely believed that homelessness is solvable. A lot of people, whether they're in the sector or not, have um, adopted this this belief that it is just a problem that we have to live with and respond to. We don't believe that. We believe that it is something that we can solve, that no individual um, needs to be experiencing homelessness. And so we're going to do this through five um, key pathways. So first, um, have overwhelming proof that homelessness is solvable. And so that means having proof points for all subpopulations, chronic, veteran, families, et cetera, across a wide variety of uh, community types. So large cities, which Portland is one of our large cities, rural areas, the coasts, uh, the Midwest. We believe that it is possible to solve homelessness no matter the environment. It, it looks different in each place, um, but we believe that it's possible and we're working to collect those proof points. And then clearing the path. So using key data, governance, and collaboration and accountability challenges and, and, and accountability have those challenges been solved in each community so that the people on the ground, the path has been cleared for them to do this work. We also believe that an end to homelessness is not possible without focusing on racial equity. And so we're looking to build a scalable framework um, for an equitable homelessness response system. And then we want to see accountability where it counts. So there's mechanisms in place to hold leaders accountable for population level reductions. And then lastly, um, we have tools for improving housing systems and supply. And so this can look like our real estate work where we're, we're actually um, building and operating affordable housing in communities. And you know, it can also look like our um, built for zero work with communities where we're assisting our, our improvement teams on the ground with landlord engagement, housing navigation initiatives, anything like that to ensure that 
the housing systems that exist or can be built are serving those that are most vulnerable. Next slide. And here's a few testimonials. I'm sure slides will be sent out so you'll be able to read these. Um, and I do wanna make sure to get to kind of the core of the presentation, but here's a couple testimonials from other communities that we have worked with and have either solved um, homelessness for one or more subpopulations like Rockford, Illinois, or have seen a shift, um, which I'll cover what a shift means, but it's a measurable reduction in the actively homeless count in their community. So just some of those leaders that we wanted to highlight here. And next slide. Perfect. So as I mentioned, we see a few problems with the way homeless response systems have been designed historically, and we have proposed solutions or how we see systems can be better designed um, to solve for these. So first, um, homelessness is a problem that many agencies and many people, of course, but many agencies will touch in a community, but there's oftentimes not a single agency or organization that owns that. And while we don't believe in necessarily having an extremely hierarchical uh, approach to the on the ground work, we do want a command center with shared community wide accountability for ending homelessness um, in that geographic area. So um, the, our command center or our improvement teams are one of the first things we support communities in building. And so Lori and Steve are, are leading the improvement team in Portland Multnomah County. Uh, next, the definition of success historically has oftentimes been limited to program outcomes. So, for example, you might have a rapid rehousing program whose success means placing people into housing and having them successfully exit from that program. You might have, um, you know, seasonal shelters or, or cold weather shelters whose measurement of success is being able to house people through those days or months where there is extreme weather and there has not always been a definition of success for community as a whole um, that focuses not on those programmatic metrics but driving down the number of actively homeless people in the communities to zero and that's really what we want to see is regardless of where every person is working the community as a whole has adopted a shared aim uh, next, efforts are oftentimes driven by static, aggregate, and nameless data. So think about the pit count. Um, think about communities that might have a daily shelter census, anything like that, that while a shelter, system, a shelter census is a bit more dynamic, if it's being done daily or weekly or anything like that, then the pit count is, it's still aggregate and nameless. We hope to see communities adopt a by name list. And I know you all have by name lists for a couple subpopulations already. But we want to see um, a by name list created so that efforts in the community are driven by real time individual level data. So we know exactly who in the community is experiencing homelessness and what their barriers are so that we can solve for that and solve for it more quickly. Um, and then lastly, the problem is oftentimes understood as solely a scarcity problem of resource scarcity. We believe that um, homelessness is a systems issue and it requires data-driven targeted housing investments. And so that's, those are um, sort of our solutions that lead into our approach, which if we go to the next slide, Let's start going over. So perfect, so the Built for Zero methodology, first, um, you want to go to the next slide? We have all these slides that start the sections, but we really can skip them. Um, so committing to a clear end state, uh, like I said, we want the communities and we believe that communities will be most successful when they are coming together around a shared goal. So the shared goal that we hope communities adopt is um, around functional zero. And we have two different definitions of functional zero. So you go to the next slide. So our, our goal for um, functional zero for veterans is that the number of actively homeless veterans is less than the six month average housing placement rate. So what that means is once you, <clears throat> excuse me, once you've hit this number, you would be able to house any veteran that becomes homeless within 30 days. Um, so the number will be less than the average monthly housing placement rate. 
And then for chronic, I'm going to go to the next slide. Our definition of chronic is that the number of actively homeless chronic individuals is less than one of two numbers, whichever, whichever is greater, either three people or 0.1% uh, of all homeless individuals. And so once a community has reached functional zero for one or both of these, or has reached this number for one or both populations, they'll have hit functional zero, and that's what we define as ending homelessness. Um, and it essentially means that for either of these subpopulations, there are either very a very, very slim percentage of the overall homeless population falling into this category and experiencing active home active homelessness, or um, you'll be able to house them in 30 days or less based on the resources in the community. And I'm happy to dive into functional zero a little bit farther if it's helpful during Q&A. We can go to the next slide. And then the next part of our approach is shifting to by name real time data. And like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is sort of the stage we're in in Portland, Multnomah County. And essentially, we want to get to a point where there is a by name list that is comprehensive, includes every um, every individual and then later on every family uh, that is experiencing homelessness. And right now, um, Portland Multnomah County is within Built for Zero is focused focused on um, chronic homelessness. And so we typically are talking about singles in this population, um, but you can expand by name lists to include all populations eventually. Next slide. And what we hope to see um, with our by name uh, data is seven key data points. So we'll have inflow, um, which includes three different data points under inflow. So newly identified returned from housing. So we knew about them before. They were in the homeless response system before, um, exited to housing and have returned, and then returned from inactive. So this could be someone who is living unsheltered and they you know, just fell off the radar of outreach and have represented, um, they can be returned to, to return from inactive and will be one of your inflow data points. Actively homeless, so the full count of people experiencing homelessness when that data is reported, and then three different types of outflow. So housing placements move to inactive or no longer meets population criteria. And so that last one is applicable, let's say on a, um, chronic single adults by name list that a community might be building. There might be an individual who is chronic and then perhaps they have another person join their household, whether that be because um, a parent, like a parent has given birth or they get married and become an all adult household, something like that. Um, they might be moved to a different by name list. So th those are the seven um, key data points that we use to determine whether or not a community is reporting quality by name data. And the next slide. And then once we have that baseline and we're we're confident in the reliability of those of those data points, that's when we start to work with communities to drive me measurable reductions. And this this how you drive reductions looks different from every community. It could be turning off those um, those channels of inflow it could be increasing outflow by increasing housing placement rates. It's oftentimes going to be a combination of both, um, but the way we approach it will look different for each community. Next slide. And when you have your data and you're reporting it and looking for these shifts, this is something that you'll be able to track. And so, and this is what we mean by shifting from a program to system thinking and and, and looking at program data versus system data. So this is an example. Um, it's from Bakersfield Kern County COC. And this is an example of their full system. So pre, you know, working with Built for Zero, um, pre kind of coming together around a shared aim, many communities, of course, their programs are tracking, you know, their housing placements and whatnot, but there's not always someone looking at each of these data points for the system as a whole. And so you can see here, this is the actively homeless count for the community as a whole. And the line, the improvement medium, median, sorry, is um, where we start to look at a shift where we're confident that a community has 
reached data reliability, and now we're looking to drive that down. So that's what that line indicates and why the, um, why the data points change colors when we start to look for a shift versus starting to look for data reliability. Next slide. Perfect. And we do this through testing. So some of you may be uh, familiar with the PDSA cycle, which is what's shown on the right here, where it says plan, do, study, act. Our approach is built on improvement science. And so we'll be working with our communities to find different tests of change, whether that's around data collection, whether that's around housing navigation and landlord engagement. Um, but we really want to ensure that the community has the improvement skills necessary to sustain this work and sustain functional zero once they have met it. And if we go to the next slide, we can look at um, the five things that we believe every community needs um, to be successful within the built for zero methodology. So one, we need that shared measurable aim. So we want communities to understand which population they're focusing on and, um, and have an aim around when they hope to really re achieve um, quality by name data and achieve functional zero. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want a nimble integrated improvement team. And so that looks again, that's our improvement team. So that's Lori and Steve. And we've had some other folks from providers and, and the outreach teams um, come on board as well. So a really integrated team and then real time by name feedback loop. So building that by name list. And then a flexible arsenal of resources, and this will look different from community to community, um, but can include, you know, flexible spending, the spending can include um, uh, different housing programs, et cetera, and then a testable menu of technical strategies. And so that's something we bring to help communities determine which tests they want to try, what feels right for the community. And so kind of where we're at right now is building this team and, um, getting to quality data. And while these are sort of the high level buckets of what we believe every community needs, how they come together and how they're utilized is going to look different for each community. So for example, in Portland, it's unique in a lot of ways. One is it's one of our large cities, but we do have far fewer large cities that we're working with than um, smaller cities or counties or even rural areas. And um, there are more unsheltered people in Portland than in other communities. Um, and so what that means is we're going to need a team that looks different than in other places. We'll need a team that's really focused on outreach. It's going to take longer, potentially take longer to um, collect that data because the more spread out people are, the less centralized they are if there are a lot of unsheltered folks, the harder it is to collect that data. And so just pointing out that, you know, even though we have a fairly built out framework, how that comes together in each community is going to look differently. And I know um, Lori and Steve will talk more about specifically where we're at in Portland right now, but just wanted to highlight a couple of things that do make Portland unique in, in the, it being a large city and um, the higher number of unsheltered and um, street homeless individuals. And next slide. And this next slide is um, just kind of our sort of framework of who you need at the table. And you can read through them. We call these individuals key improvers because everyone's coming together to improve the homeless response system. And each of these individuals will have a key vantage point or perspective on the system. So the COC representation, um, a city or county leader, um, the housing authority, outreach, different providers, um, if you're working on veterans, SS, SSVF and the VA, all of those kind of people. Um, but we just use this to give folks an idea of who they should have at the table um, to build this improvement team. And uh, next slide. This is just another visual of that. So um, a street outreach leader, VA caseworker, again, if you're working on veterans, um, municipal leader, housing provider, and housing authority. Everyone comes to the table to um, work towards that shared aim and make improvements to the homeless homelessness response system. And that is it for me. So I'm going to hand it over to Lori, I believe. Yep. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Lori. Good morning. Next slide. 
Uh, next slide again. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to thank Alice again. She did a great job of uh, describing what built for zero and quality by name list. And I just wanted to revisit really quickly what the description of, of a uh, quality by name list is, because one of the key parts about this is that it needs to be a tool to help individuals who qualify as chronically homeless connect to housing. We've kept this centered as we create and refine systems to allow for information gathering that's meaningful and can when connecting to housing and housing services. Next slide. So as Alyssa mentioned, we're in the initial action cycle. We're in the key first steps. So what have we done? We have created an improvement team. This is a multidisciplinary team that includes providers from the community, those within the joint office, who are data experts, outreach experts, coordinated entry experts. Currently, we're working towards revamping the team to ensure participation in the outreach area to focus on goals on the horizon. We've worked towards data fidelity, and I'll have Steve speak to this in a moment. We've engaged in a readiness process guided by the Built for Zero scorecard, and we've begun to work towards addressing gaps in service delivery and data um, in the data system. So with that, I will hand it over to Steve to talk about the data. Great, thank you, Lori. Next slide, please. All right, so successfully using HMIS data in the Built for Zero framework requires regular and reliable reporting of, as Alyssa pointed out earlier, the seven key data points. And just to recap, because this is a content heavy presentation, um, those seven points are the number of people for, for us, for Multnomah County right now, the number of people who are uh, chronically unhoused and in single adult households. So that specific subgroup, um, as well as the three manifestations of inflow, um, as you can see in the diagram there, um, to the by name list, to the actively homeless population, and the three ways that people can outflow from that. So that's kind of our initial focus with regard to data. Next slide, please. So thus far, we've developed internal reporting that successfully identifies people in single adult households across the entire homeless system who are verifiably chronically homeless as of the end of a given reporting period and according to available HMIS data. So we're, we're um, sort of, you know, we're, we're limited by the available data that we have, um, which is not a new dynamic, but uh, that's just kind of a key piece um, and points to a lot of the work we need to be focusing on next. Uh, but we're able to identify the people uh, who are verifiably chronically homeless, you know, so assuming we have the data for them using HMIS data. Um, and then, from the second bullet there, uh, we're also able to identify who in that population is active or inactive based upon the number of days since their last activity within HMIS. So each participant has a client record, and if that client record is not touched within uh, 90 days from the last day of a reporting period, um, they move into inactive status, which is, um, that's a mode of outflow in the Build for Zero framework. So we have that. Um, third, and, and this is really more of a next step, but um, but I put it on this slide. Uh, so our data system already has the potential to um, identify inflow and outflow. However, that reporting still needs to be developed. Uh, so once we build that, we'll we'll technically be able to report on the seven key data points. Um, and I say technically because we'll be able to produce numbers, but there's much more work to be done uh, to make that reporting complete and reliable. And that brings us to our next slide. All right, so I'm going to uh, do these in reverse. Um, so down the road uh, at the bottom of the slide, um, it's going to be important for us to overlay additional analysis onto the standard seven key data points in order to identify racial and ethnic disparities on the BNL, the by name list, um, as well as changing patterns of inflow and outflow for communities of color, particularly those that are demonstrably overrepresented in the unhoused population. Um, and then ideally, we'll also be building an understanding of how the system is responding to those changing dynamics. So I, I wanted to flag that. Um, prior to doing that, we need to build data quality monitoring and improvement processes around the by name list. Um, we also need to build out infrastructure in the broader system uh, to be able to first create and then sustain new data collection processes to ensure that we have complete and updated data for Built for Zero, um, specifically for the, um, the priority population. 
Those new processes are required to capture data for chronically unhoused people who either do not receive services from our system or do receive services, but not frequently or not in a way that would currently show up in HMIS. We need to be, build new processes to be able to capture data for those people so that we can have a comprehensive and reliable list. And uh, a good amount of that work that's required to make these improvements um, to data collection and monitoring is captured in the Built for Zero scorecard. And at this point, I'll hand it back over to Lori to talk about that. Okay, next slide. So, building uh, the quality binding list is measured by a Built for Zero scorecard. Um, the scorecard has 28 competencies that you must meet to have a quality by name list. Multnomah County currently scores 16 out of 28. We've been careful to engage in this process with the intent of updating processes and policies to ensure the by name list is truly an effective tool. And this was scored not just by internal joint staff, but by our improvement team, which we talked about, which includes community members and a multidisciplinary team. When we originally began this process, we hoped to be at 28 by April, but we're now hoping to be and planning to be um, at 26 by June. This will create and refine necessary processes and policies to get to a quality by name list. And subsequent work immediately to follow will include utilization of this by name list in an ongoing manner, which is what the final two points are frequent updating. Um, just to give a little detail around our timeline, so we've had some timeline barriers, effectively competing priorities. <laughs> Multnomah County is going through a rapid expansion, as you all know, and often the same individuals who need to inform the processes are actively working to house people with new funds, launch shelters, and ramp up programs. Also, mapping systems as they evolve is always a challenge. And finally, the desire to get it right. Gathering data and gathering data we can use are different goals. We strive to engage in this process authentically with equity and trauma informed practices centered. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this means carefully evaluating policies and practices that might technically qualify, but aren't as effective as they could be. Um, and frankly, um, it's quite the lift. As one of the few large cities taking on this population with a large number of literally homeless people not in shelters, this requires a lot of coordination. Next slide. So we've broken out the uh, many points that I described into three categories, updating and socializing policies. In many cases, we already have policies um, that Bill for Zero calls for, but um, in order to authentically engage in this process, we had to ask, are these policies updated? Are they well socialized? Are they adhered to? And if not, why? We're also clearly mapping outreach coverage, understanding outreach coverage with more depth and communicating that coverage more effectively and collaboratively. And finally, the real lift, connecting data to outreach. <laughs> this is truly the heavy lift at the heart of the quality of the by, at the quality by name list. We will get more into this further in the presentation. Next slide. So just a little bit about updating policies. The policies that we have to update fall, fall into two categories. There's outreach coordination. So um, when evaluating our policies, we realized, as I mentioned, that many of them exist, but not all of them are communicated effectively. The outreach coordination one is a good example of that. You can state a policy, but if everybody doesn't know what it is, it's not very effective. So right now, part of updating our outreach co uh, coordination policy is really working with the programs that do the outreach team to make sure that it's understood and that the mapping is clear. Then there's also the active inactive list. Next slide. So I, I mentioned this already, but there are some key considerations when we're updating a policy and equity lens or rushing into the process can actually increase harm um, involving partners and providers and people experiencing homelessness. So policy changes must be responsive to those doing outreach and in building trust. And finally, care. How do we coordinate coverage geographically and equity equitably? Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about inactive and active because it's a good example of what the detail behind updating lists are. So when we talk about who's active on the list, it's people that we're actively engaging with, but there are a bunch of policies that might describe um, how we make somebody active or inactive. Um, how long is somebody unlocatable before they're inactive? How do we address short-term times and in institutional settings? How do we ensure people are inactivated when they should be for when they're housed or when they moved? Um, and an example of this is inactivating can result in a lack of inreach in institutions if we do it too quickly. But if we don't do it quickly enough, we might lose track of someone. 
equity is a key consideration. For example, those um, who are black, indigenous, people of color are already disproportionately represented in many institutional settings. So taking care around such a policy makes sure that we're really centering equity in our policies. Next. Additionally, as we create a larger list, this includes people who are not yet on the coordinate. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Sorry about that. Could you go next slide? So I mentioned outreach coverage. <laughs> this is one of the lifts in our system. So outreach, currently we have a mapping system, but there are gaps and not all providers use it regularly. So while the system exists in crises, it's not always used to coordinate care. Some of the next steps include new hire. The joint outreach, um, the, the joint um, office of homeless services is hiring an outreach coordinator and they'll work with par partners and providers to coordinate coverage. And then next slide. And I apologize, I'm jamming along because <laughs> I know we have a time uh, thing. And I'll hand that over to Shannon. Lori, uh, Shannon Singleton, uh, she and her pronouns. Yeah, hold on, Shannon. We still can't, we can't hear you. Uh, Lori, why don't you take that slide? I can't possibly get any closer to my mic. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll try to jump in there. So collecting data during outreach is particularly sensitive. It's easier to collect data when individuals enter shelter or when they're getting on the coordinated access list to try to act to try to access services or permanent supportive housing. However, those living unsheltered may be reluctant to give personal information when simply receiving hygiene services. There is a history of systemic trauma, racism, stigma attached to homelessness, and many are not ready for the type of in-depth assessment that is attached to getting on a coordinated entry list. It's a long process that asks a lot of personal questions. So right now we're involved in a process that asks, how do we design an information gathering system that gets the minimal information necessary to ensure better coordination, cue them up to later get on coordinated access, and also maintain important relationships with outreach workers who could later mean the difference between life and death. This process will include working with our outreach partners to really find out what um, what the best system is to make sure that this outreach engagement doesn't sort of cut off those relationships before they even start. So next slide. So we realize we gave you a lot of information in a short time. We um, have a new website <laughs> that um, follows this particular process. You can see it up there. Um, in addition to an overview of what Build for Zero it is, it also has an update um, twice a month of where we are in our uh, scorecard. It has an update on our plans to how to update the scorecard and um, what are basically our project plan. And um, when we move to the point where we are confident in our data quality, it will also have the built for zero data charts. Next slide. Questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lori. And thank you, Steve and Alyssa. And sorry, Shannon, about the uh, audio. Um, but I think Lori took the slide very well. So um, we will start with questions from commissioners with Commissioner Myron. Hi. Um, first of all, Lori, thank you. It's really great. I just have worked with you at the when you're at the Health Authority and in different arenas, and it's just so wonderful to have you here at the county um, doing your incredible work. So. Thank you, um, and thank you to to Alyssa. Um, I've worked with a number of people at Community Solutions. I've connected with them. Um, I don't think I've don't think I've met you, Alyssa. But it's um, this was a great presentation. And then Steve, of course, thank you um, for your ongoing work at the Joint Office. And you know, I I may express some frustration here because all of what you're talking about embodies so much of what I have been pushing for at the county through the joint office and a home for everyone um, for, for years. And frankly, it's hard to see it suddenly be elevated as urgent and this thing that we are going to be doing and based on this SHS measure when it's something we should have been doing all along and the evidence had been has been there. It's been a Brett best practice and we need to coordinate and have that centralization and understanding of who is living outside who we are serving in order to get to any solutions. So 
it is difficult, um, honestly, but it is gratifying to finally see it presented to the entire board of commissioners. Um, uh, I think Commissioner Ryan and I had brought this for a vote a couple of years back, um, a year and a half ago with a home for everyone to implement built for zero. And so I've been waiting and waiting and hounding um, around when we're going to do it. And I know there's a lot going on, but this is a priority. So um, it is essential work we need to be doing. And um, I have a I have a few questions related to it. The first is, um, you know, just with vet, our veterans work, uh, I know when I first started at the county, that was one of the first times I had ever heard of a by name list, which is when I brought it up and I was like, we can do this for veterans, can't we do it for everyone? And no, um, not at that time. But for the veterans homelessness, when I started at the county, we were really celebrating that we had sort of solved it and we were at functional zero. And since this is a program that is a microcosm of this that we did at the county, um, I'm curious, I would love an update, it doesn't have to be here, about where we are with that, how we have sustained it, um, what the challenges were and what, what we are seeing, what we can improve moving forward. So I would just like to request that here. Um, and I would also like to ask about you know, in terms of the point in time count and the HMIS data. The point in time count we know is grossly inaccurate data and is a significant undercount of who is actually living unsheltered outside. We will be releasing that at some point, but we don't know what we don't know. And the same is true with the HMIS data. And it concerns me that we're using that, I mean, a, we need to use it as a starting point, but that we are reporting it as sort of this is going to be really what we're basing the by name count on. And for me, the by name count is the answer to both of those. It is the real data of who's living outside. And I, so many people are left at the most vulnerable with mental health issues, with substance use issues are left out of a lot of those counts. How are we learning? How are we going about getting that information? And when can we expect to have like a real true by name count of who is living outside that individualized data and what they need so we can design the services to respond to the need? There's a lot in there and I'll try to jump. Yes, to sorry, so, I know there, there is a lot in there. Absolutely. So I'm going to suggest been floating around for a long time. So. Absolutely. So first off, I'm going to um, suggest that we send an update on the veterans by name list work Great. because I feel like that could get into depth right. here. And I, but I do want to call out that you can't get to uh, chronically uh, individuals who are chronically homeless by name list without having a larger um, universe to know who is flowing into chronically homeless from homelessness. So, so we're not losing sight of other subpopulations as we're doing this. This is simply the population we're focusing on right now, and we still are doing that work. So I do want to call that out. Um, secondly, and I'll try to get these in things. So the utilization of HMIS and the point in time count. Absolutely. There's a lot of concerns around the point in time count. And I think one, uh, there's a lot of uh, cities and communities who have talked about using different methodologies to make the point in time count more effective. And often that arcs off of having a better um, sampling methodologies that have a better by name list, right? Because then you can extrapolate. So this is part of, I think, a regimented process where we'll begin to be able to utilize all our data more effectively in context. That being said, um, getting to HMIS. So um, I think we'll all be the first to agree that HMIS has its systemic issues, but I think a lot of it is how it's utilized. Um, so uh, the ability to get information on the by name list, use HMIS as a system, and by that I mean like an information system to move this through, will actually enhance our HMIS system, but simultaneously look at our, our HMIS. I also realize that some people kind of like what coordinated entry is and what HMIS is and like all this kind of flows together and HMIS is really a data system that we use to pry, you know, to do the work, you know, the, the information system to get the data in. So it's less about whether HMIS is accurate and whether our data is accurate, right? So the intent of the by name list is to, is to enrich that data and to create a bigger universe. So while um, it's, uh, 
I won't get into the operability of HMIS, but I will say that that this should solve some of the issues that you're concerned about simply by the act of having a more um, vibrant and dynamic process of collecting data, which is really what you're talking about here. And then finally, I absolutely agree. It, it's an urgent need, but I will say that since this is a system to house people, it couldn't come at a better time because I often think of it this way, like you can create this really well regimented, like line where people in the right lines for the right things, but if there's nothing in the store, there's nothing in the store. <laughs> so this is kind of comes at the same time as having a lot of resources coming online. So being able to get information to get people to the resources because people can wait on that by name list for a very long time if they don't have anywhere to be housed. So it's this exciting opportunity to do the both at once, right? And to really move people through the system. So so I, I think I, I wanted to mention that that while it's frustrating, it's also timely and ideal in many ways. Well, I mean, I, I won't get too deeply into that, but we are on the cusp of releasing a quarter three report, <laughs> which will show both um, on a system level and on an SHS level how many housing, you know, how many people have been housed, how many people have been served with those dollars, how the dollars are being expended, where we're doing towards um, system expansion. So that's how we're tracking. And I mean, we can track who's housed without having this by name list. We do that within HMIS. We do that within system, within uh, programs. So. I don't know, I don't want to lead with the um, impression that we're not tracking things till we get to this by name list. We're simply able to gather more the scope of who needs the services by this name list, not what we're doing with it. We have data systems attached to every group that's um, receiving the, you know, our dollars to make sure we know what they're doing with them. That's Well, and I can actually make that connection for you and I'll tell you how it'll show up. So, so one of the reasons that we chose um, individuals who qualify as chronically homeless versus doing veterans, which I think would have been a much faster list because we already have the by name list that would have been putting it into the system was we wanted to replicate what we're doing for population A. So the definition is extremely similar and we'll be tracking that population into care. Also, just to be clear, we already have a mechanism to track on a program and on, on a personal level who is population A that we're serving. So that information is gatherable without this, but this is intended to arc upon it and make it more nuanced. So that's why we're tracking this particular population is to prioritize the population we said we would house. So if the, I don't know if that helps at all. But. Yeah. Offline meeting and delve into that would be Absolutely. great. <laughs> um, and uh, and because I have a, a lot more questions about that. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, just another um, thing in here. I mean, there's so much. There's so much. But uh, I know that Lori will be happy to talk with and you I, too. I know okay. it just having this, you know, after so long and having this one brief, and I know hopefully we'll have more public opportunities to, but it's important to have this conversation publicly because I think this is where 
the public has had a lot of questions and concerns about how things are moving. So it's it's great to have an opportunity to bring this forward um, at a public forum. So I think one of the other questions is, you know, housing is health. Houselessness is one of the biggest, for to me, one of the biggest public health issues we're facing and is a crisis. And I think that you know, we've needed to be addressing it in that context. And I think that this can be the beginning of an approach, like this kind of data can help connect to public health. I mean, is that something that you see as a fit? And maybe Shannon um, has an answer to that, to connect those, those dots there. I, and, but I know you are, and we can have that conversation as well. I just want to elevate that too. Um, and I know you are, you have a very, very light voice right now. So um, I would love to talk to you more about that. And I know we'll, we'll be meeting soon. So um, just want to. Commissioner, I did find some old school headphones that plug right into my computer. <laughs> so you might be able to hear me now. <laughs> um, I do just want to say uh, on that piece, I, part of the thing that Lori and I have discussed that I would love to see is when folks are, uh, moving into other institutions, how do we work with them to ensure that folks don't exit those institutions back to homelessness? And so some of that data tracking across systems, I think is real, could be really powerful. Um, I would like to see us stop releasing people from our hospitals, uh, for example, back into homelessness. And so I think there's some interventions we can really uh, look at when we can see how many folks are moving into those spaces when they may be hitting in an active point on our by name list. I love that. And this is just the perfect group having, I mean, Lori at the OHA and Shannon, all the work that you've done. And I know we've connected on at the state level. This is very exciting and an opportunity here. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is calling out that need for coordination and centralization. Again, that is something that, you know, I, I has been lacking in our system and that it has in fact when i've raised you know the question of need, how can we centralize so the outreach teams know where they're going um so that we have that mapped in a way and again raising that for years and having been told it's been an affirmative decision to not be centralized um for a variety of reasons you know, I, I think this points to that need for centralization, coordination, and shared that those shared goals. And so, is there going to be a change in that sort of strategy and approach based on this this work toward the by name list and outreach? Um, to to clarify a little bit, Commissioner, I think it hasn't been formalized where it's centrally held by the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Um, or by the Portland Housing Bureau prior to that. But I don't want to minimize the amount of coordination and case conferencing that happens amongst our outreach providers on the ground. Um, so really this is a shift in moving it from the sole responsibility of the providers doing the work to how do we as, an, as a department um, support that work and staff and make the space for them to do more of a coordinated um, and regular uh, effort at case staffing um, and utilizing the by name list to help uh, support that work. So um, it's a little bit of yes and, uh, again, not wanting to minimize what they are doing around coordination, but needing to really staff um, staff up and beef up our role and how we can better support them to do that more regularly. That's, that is an area I would love, again, to have more conversation with you because I've talked to so many providers um, and have gone out with them and do that work and talk to the people living outside and it, does not feel coordinated to a lot of different people doing the work and i think the those are the people we need that can be supported through a more centralized system and like you said we need to support the people doing the work so it's the most effective outreach possible and i would love to engage offline secondary to this um later around that conversation because we need to support the people who are doing that work find the people who are living outside and figure out that system that puts it all together. And I think Built for Zero is a tremendous, tremendous step. I'm super excited and 
um, it's it's the beginning of a lot more, I hope. And I do want to make sure that we hold on to that we're talking about folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness on this front end. And a lot of our outreach providers also utilize rapid rehousing resources that are not um, necessarily targeted towards uh, folks with chronic homelessness. And so it may not look like everybody is getting into this on the front end. Um, so just remembering where we're starting uh, today with Built for Zero so we can manage expectations around um, impact on the ground. Well, I guess so why I, it feels like from the health safety saving lives standpoint that we should be starting with the people who are the that actually are like figuring that out super as soon as possible the people who are marginalized from even the you know the traditional lists how are we I, again there's so much we could have hour long conversations i hope we will how are we accounting for them the people that are marginalized from the marginalized from the marginalized that's the group that i am talking about I think we do have really good systems and approaches that we can hone, but we have approaches for the people who aren't those individuals, for the people who are that chronic group. How are we getting their list and figuring out their individualized needs and what they need so we can build it? So that's exactly what I would love to focus on and outreach and coordination there. Thank you, Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Lori, Alyssa, Steve, Shannon. Really appreciate this. It's it's going to take me a while to to synthesize, and uh, you know, I've got a couple of questions. I'm not sure I'm going to articulate them very well, but um, we'll probably have more after I've had a chance to synthesize. You know, I I, I um, I'm excited about this. I I do think it's something that the community has been asking for for a while. Um, and for me, the, the benefits of this sort of a system are, are, are a few, I guess. Um, one is agreeing on desired outcomes. And Alyssa, you know, I appreciated your point about ultimate outcomes are different from program metrics. And I do think that um, having an agreed ultimate outcome is important for a variety of reasons. So I appreciate that. Um, and the, the reasons for the data, one is to know how we're doing. That's really important. Accountability. How are we doing towards those outcomes? But then also, it seems to me, um, you know, the, the sort of even in some ways, even more important purpose of having this kind of data is to be able to adjust strategies based on what we're learning to be able to say, OK, this isn't working perhaps for this person or this group of people. Why is that? Be able to analyze that and change what we're doing So more. Reporting is important, accountability is important, and using data to change how we're approaching the problem is important. So, um, you know, that all seems really promising to me. Um, I guess a, a couple of questions. And so, as I understand it, the data will allow us to track individual people through a system. And I guess this is probably for whomever, allow us to track an individual person through the system. And then also allow us to presumably better understand the needs of the population as a whole. So how many people, you know, need X service or Y service? Is that is that right? That's exactly right. So um, effectively, you can utilize the data in two ways. You can use it on an individual level to do things like case conferencing to do population health type management of, you know, grouping people into um, necessary, uh, you know, case groups to, to help them, but then also in aggregate to analyze, we can disaggregate data on, on race and ethnicity week and we can figure out where, where people are and to do better programming based on that. And I think that's true of all group data sets if you really have that detail. Yeah. And so kind of extrapolating from that, but you know, one of the questions that I have had and that I get asked a lot is uh, how many of the people experiencing chronic homelessness or on the streets period um, are at the the sort of acute end of the spectrum of needing, you know, uh, mental health and behavioral health services, and this this will allow this system will allow us to do that to a certain extent. Yes, it will be it will be gathering data um, that we gather from homeless populations. I mean, I think one thing to know is we do ask questions around chronic homelessness, such as disability, 
um, history and so forth, and that tends to capture what you're talking about. I think some of the work of how you use the data is also what gets to what you're talking about, which is case conferencing around. If you have groups that have um, some sort of physical or behavioral health heightened need, you know, making sure that that kind of case conferencing includes people who have those specialties. So it's sort of the active use of that list that sort of gets to what you're talking about as well. Got it. And I think as it moves along, it becomes more nuanced mm -hmm. right? because you need to start somewhere and then move towards it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I guess something that would be useful to me, and this is for you, Alyssa, I think, um, to, to the, the second purpose I identified for having this data, which is how do you use it to change strategies? Can you provide an example of how it's been used by another community to, to actually change strategies? So thinking about the inflow specifically, I mean, in those three different points that make up inflow, so newly identified, returning from um, from housing and returning from inactive. If you look at that, the second one, um, if you see a lot of folks who are returning from housing, that tells us that we might have had a positive exit from the system initially, but now there is a recidivism to homelessness, right? And so that tells us that we have some work to do farther downstream, that our, our initial housing programs may be doing a really great job of getting people placed, but um, that stabilization needs some work. And so we've had a few communities um, who have done some interesting things with flexible funds, um, flexible funding pots around stabilization. And um, so, you know, having folks be able to get, I mean, furniture is a pretty big one, right? If someone can get set up in their apartment sooner rather than later, um, we see a lot of uh, a lot of positive effects there. Um, but even doing things like being able to apply to flexible funding after your two years of rapid rehousing dollars have run out to keep folks stabilized, those types of um, positive um or those types of initiatives and then the first um the first inflow of newly identified if we see a lot of our inflow is newly identified people um maybe we want to do some work around diversion these are people who are new to the system who have so far um been able to avoid entering the homeless response system and so um through strength-based diversion work, we might see some success there. Abilene, Texas is one of our communities that has done incredible diversion work, um, and they've reached functional zero for both chronic and veterans and now working on families. Um, yeah, so it really varies based on, but like, like we're saying, what we see in the data kind of informs where in the system we need to be looking and then what types of tests and, and ideas for change we want to employ. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like some of those sorts of conclusions we could probably arrive at with the kind of data that we're gathering right now, but, but I appreciate those examples. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons I'm trying to, un, you know, really understand the, the uses to which the data is going to be put is it's, uh, there's a question at the end of this for you, Shannon, is that it sounds like a quite an additional amount of resource that's going to be required to gather this data on an ongoing basis for everybody who's who's on you know who's experiencing houselessness at the moment. So Shannon, do you do we have a sense of the resource that's required to uh, kind of implement the system? We don't fully yet. I think part of our conversation with particularly our outreach providers um, is reconciling what we what data we choose to collect as part of our. Um, by name list and what they already may collect as part of their HMIS entry. And so the idea would be that they, we can build upon this data over time um, so that it's not, we don't have to ask the same person the same set of questions. Um, same thing with the coordinated access list. We would start with this base that we, we get for the by name list data and then workers can build on that um, in the HMIS system as they're adding additional data points for coordinated access. Uh, so some of that is conversations to come, um, as well as uh, talking about where in the process they do this. Um, I think Lori spoke a little bit about um, best practice outreaches and to walk up and ask somebody to, to answer some data questions. And so working with our providers to allow them to still stay in that best practice space around their outreach and engagement work for the long-term housing placement support. 
uh, but also gathering some of this data at a point in time for them in their process that makes sense to help keep our list active and up to date. Thank you. That's helpful. And then one one uh, kind of last question. It's a bit of a detailed question. You know, I heard you. I think it was Alyssa say it's 90 days until someone's deemed inactive. So so there's this time period that defines when someone's deemed inactive, and that that seems sort of odd to me because that 90 days could be caused by any number of things that have aren't necessarily related to that person's situation, but rather related to what's happening in the system. Exactly. Okay. So actually, that that was a little bit. Um, I think it kind of came completed together. So some of the questions we ask when developing an inactive policy is how long do we want timelines to go on before we inactivate somebody and what are some of the triggers? So the 90 days that we talked about were people who are um, um, in institutions. So for example, hospitals or systems. So over 90 days and a lot of people become automatically inactivated for some other obvious reasons. But what do we do about people when they're in brief interactions and how do we make sure we stay covered? Other than that, we have the ability to create some nuanced policies around inactive inactivity. What, how do we make sure that people are staying connected, but that we're also not, that we're focusing our time well. And so it's not necessarily automatically 90 days, it's us deciding together what we're going to do around that. I also wanted to speak briefly to some of the questions around how we use the data. Um, one of the things we haven't gone into depth around, but um, Built for Zero has a lot of collaborative learning abilities. So one of the things that the leads have been doing is um, at least monthly, we have cohorts that we meet with that talk about some of this work and we we brainstorm around how they're using the data. And so there are groups that are new to the process and we're talking with them, but then there are also is access to groups who have done the process so we can reach out to them. So I feel like that's an asset of, we've come to this problem, what did you do? So I feel like that can't be undersold when you start to think about how do you make connections to other communities that have either seen progress or have found it to be, found a huge barrier that they're not quite sure how to get past and how do they do that. Absolutely. I mean, that, that does sound like a huge advantage. You know, this, we, as, as we know, we're not the only ones facing these challenges. And so to be, to be uh, kind of checking in with other cohorts seems, seems really important. So thank you. I, I may have other questions, but that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I appreciate my colleagues' questions. I know that we are running very short of time. So just thank you, Lori, Alyssa, Steve, and Shannon for the presentation. Um, I mean, my first question that I had listed down was, can you more clearly define inactive for me? So I appreciated Commissioner Jayapal's question. And it sounds like you are still kind of figuring out what exactly that definition of inactive needs to be for Multnomah County. Um, but we can have further conversation about that because um, I think that is, you know, like you said, it's moving, you know, if it appears that they're inactive, um, it, you know, that's going to be a positive sign, right, for it. But if that's not true, truly the case, then um, how does that impact our data? Um, but I do want to say just overall, like, I'm very excited about this work. I think having this kind of data available is going to help us, like, very strategically and effectively bridge the resources that we have from the supportive housing services measure and other sources to target, um, you know, in this case, the chronically um, homeless population. Um, so I have some general questions, um, you know, more about um, the Built to Zero program, like, around the largest size community that you've worked with. Um, so far, and and you know, I think it's it, it sounded like you had said that Portland and Multnomah County are going to be the biggest ones so far. So I'm I'm curious about what, if any, adaptations are being made or need to be made to this to scale up to Multnomah County, and how you know what that looks like. Um, and I'm I'm giving these questions out, but I don't expect you to answer them right now because I because we're out of time. So I want to you know I just want to get them out there, and then um, you know I would like to have a better sense of what the data gathering is going to look like. And Shannon, I appreciated your comments, um, your, your just your last comments about that. Um, you know, because if we're if we're supposed to like ideally getting this these numbers updated monthly, right? That that sounds like that's a huge force of people who are just going to be working on getting data, right? Like being doing the outreach work to get the data on on that kind of frequency. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's one of the areas that we're looking at. Um, and then I am very curious about both how this information, this data that's focusing on the chronically homeless population is going to be, and, and really, you know, single heads of household is what I thought that, you know, it sounded like the definition was, how we're bridging that to the information, the work that we're doing with couples, with families, with folks who aren't experiencing chronic homelessness, chronic homelessness, like just, you know, where the bridges are going to be in that overall work that we're going to be continuing to do. Um, 
And then finally, I would love to hear more about the strategies that we'll be doing to focus on racial equity in, you know, as embedded in this work. So those are my questions for future conversation and answers. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you for those um, questions, Commissioner Mayor Peterson. Those are all really spot on. And I'm hoping that um, Shannon and Lori can get together and and send out. If you, and again, I just have to keep my re repeating myself on this. Please send it to all the commissioners because those are questions that I know that everyone would like to hear the answers for. Yeah, and I will just add. Um, I and I would look forward to like a, a future conversation about this too because I'm sure I will have more. Like Commissioner Jack will have more. You know, as we. Um, um, Synthesize all this. Commissioner Stegman, last but not least. Thank you. I, I, I'll just lay out some questions. I don't expect you to answer them, but um, so, you know, we uh, essentially had functional zero for veterans a few years back and well done. So I kind of like to see, like, can we look at that data and how is what you're doing now different? And obviously, I don't think we still have functional zero uh, for veterans homelessness. Uh, along Commissioner Vega Peterson's lines of like, what are the, so we prioritize chronically homeless individuals, but there's other subpopulations and what's the order of operation. Uh, so I'm assuming we, we solve for this population. What are the next populations? Uh, I also have questions about outreach. Uh, could we do some type of outreach when we have like our winter shelters or, and I, I know that those are emergencies, but it seems like such a lost opportunity when we have people. So I'd love more conversation about that. Obviously, there's been challenges in, in collecting names when we're giving services, and I understand that. Uh, otherwise, we would have been doing it, right? So, but it brings up like, okay, so how are we gonna do this? It, it is my question. Uh, and what kind of impact at some point will, I mean, I know it's a federal requirement, but it's like if we're getting all this data rich information, do we need to do the point in time count? Um, and what impact will that have on the point in time count? Would love to know more about the data reliability. I think it said 25 that I, I just didn't understand like what that means. Um, what is the timeline for this particular project? Like when do you think, what are the benchmarks for implementing Built for Zero? Um, Still confused about the coordinated access lists compared to the HMIS, compared to the built for zero. Like, how do all of those systems talk to each other? Will they talk to each other? I, I don't know. Um, procurement, like, how are we going to uh, include in our procurement the, the data that we're asking for and the mapping? And then you mentioned that you can track who, who is getting housed without the by name list. I was just kind of confused about, I wasn't really clear about that. Um, and, oh, and then I did like the, the topic where I think someone talked about the flexibility of like, if people, if you wanted to use money for, so people could buy furniture and things like that. And it made me think about the ancillary uh, CBLs that we have, like the community warehouse. So, I mean, I think we need to be thinking systematically about all the different services that people uh, would need. So that's my laundry list of questions. Uh, it was a great presentation. And while I know that there was frustration, um, this is a really, really good first step. Uh, and it's like, at least we're taking that step. So uh, I'm excited. Uh, Shannon, I know you, you've stepped in and taken on a huge responsibility and, and, I'm, and I know you're gonna do a great job, uh, but, but I'm excited about the presentation. So thank you all so much. So Shannon, we do have a few minutes left. I know that some of uh, those questions I think could be um, answered right now. And I want, do wanna leave you with a little bit of time to respond. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did want to say uh, briefly on the auxiliary services piece in community warehouse, uh, most, if not all of our provider partners do uh, have relationships there um, at mo both of their various warehouses. And I know that folks have the flexibility um, to also purchase things within our allocations that really will help a family um, set up their new household and be stable. Um, and I'm using family broadly to mean a person moving into a new apartment. Um, uh, we can, uh, 
absolutely provide some updates around. I think the outreach policy, those were some of the pieces that we're talking about that we wanna to continue to develop in partnership um, with our provider partners and folks who are actually um, experiencing homelessness to know what's what's most effective. And um, this is something that we're gonna to have to try and see what's working. And I think to Alyssa's point earlier in the presentation, I'm um, go through some process improvement about what is really the most effective um, for the folks on the ground. Uh, some of the timeline pieces I do just want to come back to. Um, Lori had mentioned in her part of the presentation that uh, our new timeline and benchmark is to reach a 26, a score of 26 on uh, the scorecard for Built for Zero uh, by June. And so that's some of the pieces that uh, we're missing to get there is what we discussed today around, um, again, that outreach mapping and policy and coordination. Um, I will also say uh, the piece around some of the other lists, um, excuse me. Um, while well, Sam is taking a moment, I will mention that we have um, the project plan and the timelines on the website that we cited. So you can also look up there and see what our plans are as far as like next steps and what our hoped full timelines are. And while she, oh, you ready, Shannon? Oh, yes. I just wanted to say the other piece um, on the veterans. So we absolutely um, can provide more of a, a detailed response in where we're at with that um, initiative. Uh, I know I've heard that from a couple of folks. And I would say um, the piece that is different is really just the population. Um, we're looking at not just exclusively veterans for this initiative, um, but looking at folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness. Uh, so I wanted to at least touch on those that we knew we could answer quickly. Thanks everyone for this presentation this morning. Um, if you didn't get your questions answered, could you please send them to Liam and he'll collect questions from everyone and then pass them off to the joint office team. Um, and I wanted to just add as well, Commissioner Stegman, your questions around the point in time count. While it is, we do, we have to do it currently for, for our for HUD requirements. We are um, looking at, and I think you've heard that there are other communities who are developing um, counts that are maybe more effective for for use in addition to their the to the way we do the PIT but we have to be in conjunction I mean we need those federal dollars so we don't want to do anything that stands in, in the way and with that um, appreciate all of your time thank you commissioners who are at the end of the line today for being patient take care see you on Thursday morning at 9 30.